The Stonewall Inn was a dump. That's a direct quote from our guest today. You'd go there in the 60s and dance and have a blast, but what you wouldn't want to do was order a cocktail or mixed drink. Now, this is a detail that I'd never heard before. Jay Tool says that the Stonewall Inn was such a rundown bar that it barely had any running water, and so none of the glasses that they served drinks in really ever got clean. Jay was nearby in Washington Square Park when the uprising began that night in 1969. She'd been living there since the age of 13 after her parents kicked her out of the house, and when she and the others who lived in the park heard what was going on, they rushed over. Jay describes it as one of the best nights of her life. It was just utter madness in the most exciting way. She got to yell at cops and throw things at them, and for once, she got to see them scared of her. By that point in her life, most of her ribs had been broken by cops, some multiple times. And so this night was something special, something to celebrate and take advantage of. For over 25 years, Jay Tool lived on the streets of New York City, and the miraculous part of her story, literally miraculous, is that the girl she had a crush on and dated for a brief but intense moment back then, that relationship through the blessing of the internet and chance was rekindled just recently, 55 years later. I cannot wait for you to hear that story and get to know Jay, so let's do it. From The Advocate Magazine, in partnership with Vlad, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and A. I want to start off with when you were 13 and kicked out of your family's home for being gay. Going back to that time, 13 is so young in terms of like development and conception of sexuality. That young, what kind of understanding did you have of your own queerness at that age? I think I've always known that I've liked girls since about maybe eight or nine, my first kiss. Then I had a crush on my nun. <laughs> I always felt, you know, there was something strange with me that, you know, I didn't like little boys. Yeah, I, I think I always knew that it was uh, girls that I was wanted to be with. And so at 13, were you identifying as gay? You know, when I first came out, I, ha I had this friend. You know, none of the kids were allowed to talk to me when I was 12. My mom had a severe mental health issues, so none of the kids were allowed to play with me anymore. But this one girl from a different neighborhood brought me to her home, you know, and it was railroad apartments, you know, back then, tenements. And we walked in, and down this long hallway, there was a bunch of rooms, and it was like, she had a gazillion brothers, you know, and this is my brother Bob and John and Jim and Jack. And we got to this room, and this is my sister Florence, and I stopped dead in my tracks. And I stepped back to look in the room, and here was this person named Florence with a, an Elvis Presley haircut curl coming down dressed in boys' clothes. I went to that fucking house every day <laughs> just, just to see this person. I wasn't quite 13 yet. And eventually she called me in and uh, she brought me out. And then her and her best friend took me to the village to ask the place, barbershop, which is still there, and got me my first haircut, which was a flat top. What, what is a flat top haircut? It's almost like a crew cut, only a little shorter. All okay. right. Did you like that? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, my God, yes. They took me and they bought me a boy's shirt. A maroon, I, can, I can see it to this day. A maroon short sleeve shirt, black dungarees, bought me some kicks. And I went home and my father took one look at me. <laughs> he said, get out, get the fuck out. So I ended up on the streets at 13 at Washington Square Park, and I lived there for a long time in the bushes, on the benches. And this was 1963, 64, somewhere around there. Did you go to Washington Square Park that first night? That first night, yeah. Was it, so was it like just like generally known and that like if you didn't have a place to stay, you'd go there? Well, those, those two butchers had brought me to the village a few times. So I knew that there was people like me you know, th that were down there. I didn't talk to anybody for days because I was scared shitless, man. You know, I was in those bushes with the rats and the squirrels and <laughs> everything else, you know, and these other kids came over to me and they asked me if I was hungry. I joined that little family, you know, and there was so many, so many homeless queer kids out there. Back then, that one section of the park was just, just queerness. You know, it was just, it was just gay. And everybody had their own little family sections, you know. It was amazing. 
So this family welcomed you into theirs. Yeah, they did. You know, they taught me how to survive, how to make money, how to get food, how to steal, you know, how to rob people. <laughs> you know, it was survival. It was nothing but survival. You know, there's no judgment. I hope that your listeners don't make any judgments of this because kids are still doing this today. Queer kids are still out on the streets surviving any best way that they can, the way I did 50-something years ago. Do you feel that people like make judgments about you because of that? I did for a long time. When they'd hear my story about, you know, being in jail, all the arrests I've had. So, yeah, I thought, you know, it would scare people away or they would think, uh, ah, she's still that way. Maybe we better stay away. But I got, got over that pretty fast, though. I think, like, when I think about living on the street, I think of it as, like, a lonely thing. But it sounds like you had, like, a family or, like, had a community there. Yes, For many years, it was a community of homeless queer kids. As I got older and moved away from the village, the drug addiction took me to places where it was terribly lonely. I remember this one time, I was on 25th Street and 3rd Avenue, and I didn't talk to anybody for over a year. Not a word, didn't say anything. And this poor woman came walking down the block, and I ran up to her and I said, talk to me! (laughs) And I scared the shit out of her. She ran around the other side, she ran around the corner. But I, you know, I must have come out of whatever, you know, your homelessness takes you to places that you just don't want to go. You know, people don't even think about the different uh, mentalities and the the predicaments and the things that homeless people go through. And it's not because we want to be homeless, you know. Back then, there was nothing for us, you know. Today, we have the Alifornia places, the center. The center wasn't there. You know, there was nothing there where we could go and get help or ask people for help. Back then, as a kid... Elders would come through the park, queer elders, and would, you know, give us food, sometimes take us home with them for showers and a meal, and sometimes it was out of the goodness of their hearts, and sometimes it was for sex, and that's okay. It's how we, how we lived. Yeah. When you say, like, it was it queer people in the park, are you saying the majority of the people in the park were queer or just, like, your section? There's one section, if you walk in on McDougal, past the Little Round Circle, that one lane going up the middle of the park, that was completely queer. To the right of that were all drug addicts and alcoholics and mostly men. Not that we weren't drug addicts and alcoholics because we were also. Did it feel safe? It was safe in that one segment. You never went to the, you never went to the bathroom there by yourself. You'd always go there with your crew. You know, because you didn't know who was in there, who was waiting for you to walk in, that would come in behind you. You know, a lot a lot of queer people have been raped in there and beaten. The cops never bothered us. They didn't care. You know, we weren't causing problems. You know, we were just sleeping, doing our drugs. Like, we didn't bother anybody. I, I know it's a weird question, but how did you, like, afford drugs and alcohol? <laughs> well, we robbed stores. We robbed people. I became a very good pickpocket. Definitely robberies. And then on McDougal, some of the restaurants hired us as cleaning up the tables and things like that for food. And then I got a job with the mafia. I was running numbers. Me and my friend were running numbers for them. And if people don't know what that is, that's like going into a bodega now or a store and buying a lottery ticket for three numbers or four numbers. But back then, there was no computers. People would come up to us, tell us their numbers. We'd write it on a little piece of paper. You know, and they'd give us their 50 cents, a quarter, a dollar. And that money would go back to the mafia. And if their number came back, we'd come back with their money. A funny story is that me and my friend thought it was a good idea not to bring uh, the money back to the guys. So we took the money that we had and we got the whole park stoned. We just spent all of their money. Oh, my God. And the next night, we seen one of their guys coming into the park. And me and my friend took off. And this was maybe about 9, 10 o'clock at night, I guess. And all you could hear was pop, pop, pop. Now, if he wanted to kill us, he would have killed us. Just wanted to scare us. But the next morning, we were on our hands and knees, literally on our hands and knees. Like, please don't kill us. Please don't kill us. We'll get you your money back, you know, whatever. So they didn't kill us, (laughs) you know. But they did give us a job, and we started dealing heroin in the neighborhood. Was that to pay them back or just to make your own income? That was to pay them back. And we didn't mind because we were heroin. I was a heroin user by then. So we, you know, we tapped the bags and used it ourselves. Years later, years, years later, maybe in 65, 66, I ran into him again. And he said, you looking for a job? And I said, yeah. He says, I'm running this uh, lesbian bar, the speakeasy. 
He said, you want to be the bouncer there? I said, sure. What was the bar called? Uh, Bohemia. Cafe Bohemia, 15 Barrow Street. So that was the 60s. You must have been pretty young to be a bouncer. I was. I was chicken shit. Man. Was you like, would not intimidate me at the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back then, man, you would have. <laughs> you walk in the front of the bar, and it would look like a regular bar. And then you open up this door, and you walk into this, like, lesbian nirvana, man. And I'd sit up on this stage, and there was a jukebox in the corner and, and tables and everything. And it was illegal for us to be served alcohol, so it was bring your own. When the cops would come to raid it, the guy in front, I'm not mentioning any names, the guy in front would hit, hit the button under the bar and a red light would go in the back room, right, where I was. And that was for me to make sure that, you know, two girls weren't dancing, there was no alcohols on the table, the jukebox would either go off, just make sure everybody was as safe as possible. But you knew that once the cops came in, they weren't going to go out by themselves, that somebody was going to go with them. But if they didn't like you, you were going for one reason or another. They were not leaving there by themselves. Somebody was going to go and you just hoped it wasn't fucking you. I mean, did you even have an ID back then? I did. It wasn't mine. And, and I, I used to pass, and it was Melvin somebody. I had a guy's ID. And so with your short hair and your, like, button-up, you were going by Melvin. Yeah, you know, chest binder and everything, yeah. Just thought I was a short little guy. <laughs> a short little young guy. I mean, when you were talking about the bathroom not being safe at the park, I was thinking about, like, when you're living in the park, like, sleeping on a bench. Like, what happens when you get your period? Well, luckily for me, <laughs> you know, I get it for like half a day, <laughs> you know, so I didn't have to worry about that shit. But the girls, a lot of socks, a lot of white socks. Really? Because you can't afford the, the Kotex or anything. But a lot of white socks. We'd steal white socks. Wow, I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> I didn't know if it was inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst the, the, the family you had at the park, was there like dating and hooking up? Oh, yeah, of course. The woman I'm with now, I met in 64, 65 at the Club Bohemia. When she'd come in through the park, I'd just make sure I'd say, there's the girl. And I would let the other butchers know, don't fuck, she's mine. <laughs> you know, we were together for a while, but her family uh, had her put away as a wayward girl. I thought she didn't love me anymore and she didn't come back and this and that, you know, so I went on. And then in 2019... In 2019, I get this email. I, w I did an interview for Democracy Now! And she's seen me on, on, on the Democracy Now! And she sends me an email. Are you her? Did you live in the Bronx? Did you have monkeys? And I wrote back, I said, yeah, that's me. Is this Linda? <laughs> and we're back together. 55 years later, here we are living together, living our life, you know, because of some stupid shit that happened all those many, many years ago. And our love is like, it, it, we just knew. It was like, oh my God. I got on a plane and went to Florida so fast to see her that it <laughs> made my head spin, you know. And now she's back up here in New York with me and uh, with snowbirds. Jay, that is the craziest thing you've said yet, that you met this woman in the 60s and had a crush on her, and now you're dating. God, I was in love with her. I bought her a ring. I bought her a ring. You know, it was illegal to get tattoos back in those days, right? It was illegal. But there was a guy that used to come to the park and give free tattoos. So I bought her a ring, and he married us. <laughs> and then we had an argument, and she took the ring, and she threw it in the mailbox on McDougal and 8th Street. I sat there all fucking night waiting for the mailman to come to get this ring back, you know? Oh, no, I was in love with her. Still am. Oh my God. How old were you back then? I think I was 17 and she was 16. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it's just like mind blowing that you had this happen with this girl as a teenager and now you're together all these years later. It's quite the love story. It's like never give up. We didn't break up. We didn't have an argument. It was just something outside things. And maybe that was good because we probably would have killed each other back then. When you said that that girl, I think her name was Florence, when you were like 13. Yeah. I think you used the phrase that she brought you out. Right. Was that like a sexual experience? Yes, that was a sexual experience. And I knew right away I didn't like being on the bottom. <laughs> you know, I, I just knew it. It was like, oh, no, I, this doesn't feel right. And uh, it stopped right then and there. <laughs> and so at 13, you were kicked out of your home. and you, you must have stopped school then too, right? I think it was second week of sixth grade where I stopped school. So my vocabulary isn't that great. You know, you don't have the education to sit down and write something. But when I was in my 60s, 
I ended up in the New York City shelter system. I got better and everything else. They told me I should take my GED, and I did, and I passed, so I got a GED. I never went into the shelter system because every queer person in New York knows you don't want to go into New York City shelter system because it's not safe for queers. I was beaten up in there by security guards. I was thrown down a flight of stairs by security guards. But then also I used to buy my crack from the social workers. You know, there was a shelter in Brooklyn called BWS, which we called Bitches with Stems. And we'd buy our crack from the social workers there. From the staff members. Yeah, social workers, maintenance men, all of them. You know, it was just, it was notorious back then. It was bad. I mean, I wonder, like, living on the street for that long, was it, was it 30 years? It's close to 30 years. You know, I've lived, I've lived in the parks, I've lived on sidewalks, I've lived in boxes. I lived down underneath the train platforms of Penn Station. That's where, when they sweep the tracks, they sweep all the garbage into these rooms, and that's where I lived with the rats, man. It was like, it was insane. So, like, living for 30 years like that, I just wonder, like, today, like, how did that imprint itself on you that shows up in ways still? Well, I can't walk past a homeless person without giving money or a cigarette, you know, because I know what it's like to be out there and, and acknowledge them. You know, being out there, people walk past you all day long. You know, they don't, they don't, see, they don't see the homeless. And I tell people, you don't have to give money. You just walk by and say, hey, you know, you don't have to give anything. You don't have to stay there and have a big conversation with people. Let us know that, you know, you've seen us. We know you're there. You know, we can't help you, but we know you're alive, that you're there. I mean, I think that, like, our ability to walk by a homeless person on the street and, like, carry on with our day and, like, not, like, think about it again is, like, a scary fact of, like, being human. It's sad. You know, it is. And now that I look back on it, you know, I've been out of homelessness, uh, what, 20 years, I think, this year. Yeah, it was, it was lonely, you know, and, you, you know, you don't trust anybody. It took me a long time to trust people, to actually have a conversation with people. When I was in the shelter system in New Providence, where I graduated from, they gave me a diploma. <laughs> when I sobered up in there, I, I looked around and I seen how, how really bad shelters were, you know, and I started thinking about it. And I started taking all the soda cans that uh, people would drink, wash them out, bring them back and get money for it so that I'd have money so that when a new girl came in and she didn't have a toothbrush or she didn't have this, I could get that for her. Or if you were sent, if you were sent to the hospital, mainly the mental institutions, they'd send you to Bellevue on a, on a, immediately. I'd go visit them and bring them candy or snacks. I wanted to treat people the way I wanted to be treated and wasn't. I never wanted anybody to feel the way I did. And I tried my best, you know, not to, not to do that. Wow. So what was that process like for you to finally stop living on the streets? You know, they put me in this place in the, in the late 90s. And it was a good shelter. It was, shelters are bad, 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 bad. But this was one of the better ones. The director was queer. My social worker was cool. And I'd keep on leaving the shelter and going out and smoke crack and come back. You know, my social worker would just, she wouldn't say nothing to me. She'd lean into my ear and say, it's your choice. It's your choice. You know, and I never heard it. I never heard that it was my choice. So I went out this one night and these kids in front of Madison Square Garden walked past me and said something really derogatory to me, and I said something back to them. And they had these small lead pipes and beat me in my head. Oh, I mean, one of the worst beatings I've ever had. And I went back to my shelter, and they put me in the hospital. And it was there, you know, when I started waking up and all bandaged up and everything, it was there that it was like, oh, it's my choice. <laughs> I don't have to go out there and get high and get beaten up and maybe murdered, you know like so many other people that I knew were killed out there. So when it was time to leave the hospital, I called my, my social worker at the shelter and I said, I don't want to use anymore. Can you send somebody to get me? I don't want to have to come back by myself. And they didn't have anybody. So this was in June of, I think, 2000 or 1999. And I had a few dollars in my pocket. I walked out of that hospital and, and walked from the 70s I was up in Presbyterian to the 40s. And I just kept on saying, well, you can buy a six pack of beer. You can buy a couple of hits of crack because crack was only $2 back then for a cap. And I just kept telling myself, nah, you know, wait till the next corner, wait till the next corner. 
And I got back to the shelter without picking up. And I never picked up crack again or heroin or pills. <laughs> did, did the shelter help you find a place to live after that? Yeah, you know, they had this, and I think it's a wonderful program, and I don't know if they still have it. They got me this wonderful apartment in Brooklyn, huge, huge place, and I stayed there, and that's when I got involved. I did a, went to school to become a substance abuse counselor. I passed everything. I got money because I was best in my class and this and that, but I never went for the test because I, I realized that I didn't want to sit at a desk and try to just help one person that I needed to go back into the streets, back into the shelter system, and do as much help as I could for many people, maybe. You know, I used to do tours. Hopefully, next summer, I'll be able to start those tours again. I started in 1963 and work our way up through the village, what it looked like, what it smelled like, what it tasted like. What did it taste like? <laughs> <laughs> it tasted good, and sometimes it was crap. It was crap when the cops grabbed you and you caught those beatings. Or the Women's House of Detention, where I've spent some time there. The Women's House of Detention is pretty famous, and I don't think many people like outside of New York has heard of them. Yeah, I think it was a 10-story building. It was around from like the 30s of the 70s. Primarily queer women were housed there. Or I mean, not housed, but like imprisoned, right? <laughs> yeah, right. House sounds too nice. <laughs> now the place was uh, a nightmare and a playhouse, all in one. I, I was there, I, I was arrested a lot. What, why was it a playhouse? Well, because... You know, in the movies, they show that they pull a lever and the doors close, right? The cell doors close. Back then, they didn't. The CO, the correction officer, the CO, would come down the hall and close your gates, right? Boom, 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 boom. So everybody, you could smoke back then. Everybody smoked filter cigarettes. Even if you didn't smoke filter cigarettes outside, you smoked it in jail. Because we used to break off the filter, stick it in the jam of the lock, right? When she'd come... It sounded like it was locking, but it wasn't locking. So there was, there's four tiers, cell block A, B, C, and D, and then a long corridor in the middle, and that's where she would sit at night. So when she'd fall asleep or whatever she was doing out there, we'd open up our cell doors and go visit our friends, <laughs> our friends, our girlfriends, our mates, you know. So that it was part of a playhouse back then, you know. There was always something going on. You know, the nightmare of it was, you know, the physical... Uh, the physicals they'd give you when you first go in were horrendous. I don't know if it was harder on butchers or if this was all women. I'm not sure. But uh, it was terrible, terrible, terrible. And I can feel it in my bones. I can still feel it in my bones. I can taste it, you know, what was done. Wow. I should say, too, that the historian Hugh Ryan has a book coming out about the House of Detention next year. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, he's my buddy. Aww. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding, too, is that, like, the Women's House of Detention was a place, it was like a queer gathering place, almost like a stonewall bar. Like, this was a part of, like, community almost, like, a presence in, like, your lives, right? Yeah, you know, the building itself was a presence in our lives, you know. And inside, also, it's your own communities, your own cell block, mostly queer or gay for the stay, one or the other. But yeah, it was, it was mostly queer, and you know, sit around, sex, yes. Usually I was always on the side that the window looked out on Whalen's Drugstore, which was 8th Street and 6th Avenue, Whalen's Drugstore in Needix. And that's where all the lesbians would meet. I'll meet you at Whalen's. Everybody knew, go to Whalen's, and that's where everybody would meet up. You know, and when I was in, in jail, I'd look out that window and see them all down there. And I'd say, oh, look at those idiots. It took me years to realize. I said, wait a minute, they're outside. I'm inside. <laughs> I'm not the idiot. <laughs> So my arrests were for, like, not having the three articles of female clothing on, drugs, too many things. <laughs> too much crap. We also, I guess, um, I would be, like, fired if we didn't talk about Stonewall. <laughs> Before we get to Stonewall, though, can you describe that bar for everybody and, like, what it was like? Oh, what a dump. It was a dump back then. You know, it's not too, too, it's not too much better now. <laughs> you walk in, it, it was dark smelly. You never drank any mixed drinks there, ever, you know, because they hardly had any running water. So the glasses were always washed in dirty water. <laughs> and you didn't know what was in the bottles that they were giving you. So you either brought your own little bottle. No way. But uh, yeah, you didn't buy any mixed drinks in there. The bartenders were friendly. You know, the bar now is only one section. Back then it was two sections. And there was an alcove in the back 
where you'd walk in the bar and then maybe halfway through, you could swing into the other into the other room of Stonewall. And that's where mostly we, are. we hung out. Music was always blasting. People were dancing. We were at home where we could be ourselves and hold each other and dance together. And so the night of the uprising, when it began, you were in the park when you heard about it, right? I was. There was a bunch of us, you know, and we were sleeping in the park. And it was early in the morning, maybe one, two. Do you remember specifically about what you heard was going on? Um, I asked because police raids were not uncommon. So, like, what did you hear to let you know that what was happening was something special, something unique? Yeah. You know, we didn't have cell phones back then, and everything was by word of mouth. You know, and the village, man, you, you couldn't keep a cigarette in the village if you wanted to. You know, you just couldn't. So word came into the park. They said something was going on at Stonewall. Something's going down at Stonewall. And just by the sound of it, you know, if it was a raid and somebody was just coming, you know, okay. But it was a different, it was a different sense, you know, that this, this was different. Now, when, when we got there, when I got there, it was already, things were, happened already, you know, people were arrested. I do remember the lieutenant yelling into the crowd, to get back, get back, and nobody was really moving, and someone threw a bottle. Then he started yelling, whoever threw that bottle, come out, we're going to arrest you. Like, who was going to come out? Really? (laughs) You know, the streets were just, oh my God, the streets was just yelling. It felt so empowering to be able to yell at a cop and not get beat up, you know, and, and a lot of people did get beat up that night. But it was, oh, just to yell at them and scream at them and throw things at them and see them scared. You know, you could see it in their eyes that they were scared. And it must have surprised them that they were scared of a bunch of gay people. (laughs) You know, like, what the hell? You know. So it sounds like utter madness, but also like fun madness. It was. I think it was one of the best nights I've ever had when it came to doing things like that. And I look back on it for that one little moment, even though we didn't like each other or to get along with each other, maybe that one moment in time, we all came together. All of us came together to say enough is enough. You got to stop. You have to stop beating us. You have to stop arresting us. You just have to stop and let us live. Let us live. Again, being homeless and an addict. Every day we were fighting for our lives with the cops. Most of my ribs have been broken multiple times by cops and fighting for who I believed in, which was myself. This is who I am. I'm not going to change. Once you did finally get that first apartment in Brooklyn in your 50s, I think you were. Did it take a while to adjust to that? I stayed in my apartment for a month with no lights because I was embarrassed to ask somebody, how do you turn lights on? I was too embarrassed to say, how do I turn my lights on? You know, well, you have to go to the electric company. Well, I went to the electric company. No one told me that I have to bring a lease with me. No one told me that I need credit. I didn't know any of this stuff. And when I went to work at the, in the shelter system, one of the things we would go through was ADL. Adult daily living is like, when you get out, this is what you have to do. Don't get stuck. Because if you're homeless for that long, you don't know. You don't know how to do the washing machine. I didn't know what a cell phone was. <laughs> we were living on 31st Street, and we seen all this one day, we noticed these people walking down blocks. And we thought, because we were close to Bellevue, we thought that they let everybody out of Bellevue because they were talking to themselves, not realizing, not even realizing that these were cell phones they were talking into. All you know is your homeless family, and we all knew the same thing, survive. So you're missing these, or missing out on these like massive leaps in technology. Yes, yes. If someone is kicked out of their home, if they have nowhere to stay, if they can't stay with friends or family, if, like you, there, there were not like shelters that were safe, do you have suggestions for people in that position? Unfortunately, the only places, you know, really are the shelter system, and, and, and they're not the best, and I'm not advocating anybody to go into them. But I would, if you're queer, get a hold of the center, get a hold of Coalition for the Homeless, definitely get a hold of Partnership for the Homeless, Anya's queer, and she would definitely help. And she always has her hand out. She had, she's the one that dragged me out of this homelessness. Are there parts of living on the street that you miss? Yes. <laughs> like what? Paying bills. I didn't have to pay any bills back then. Now I got to remember, you know, I have everything on auto because I probably wouldn't pay them. <laughs> you know, I miss uh, the air. 
sleeping outside in the air. Yeah, that's about it. When was the last time you slept outside? Like, like by choice? When I went down to see Linda, we slept on a trampoline. We're in our 70s and we went, what a fucking trampoline. Are we insane or what? And we slept, we slept out on the trampoline. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't sleep out there anymore. It's brutal. It's hard. You know, it's so hard on your body. The people that I see out there now, and it seems like so many more, and the kids out there. It just breaks my heart when I see them or talk to them. You know, they're thrown out for the same reasons I was thrown out. You know, whatever the reasons why these uh, kids are out on the streets where they shouldn't be. We just got to do better, you know, as adults. Because even though I'm talking about my history, there's so many more out there that are my history. It's our history. And people got to know what it was like out there and what it's still out, like, out there today. I appreciate you taking so much time with me. Thank you for this. I thank you. And you're a little cutie pie. (laughs) And that was Jay. Big thank you to them and also to Sage who connected us. If you don't know, Sage is a really fantastic nonprofit that specifically focuses on advocating for LGBTQ elders. So they do really, really important work. Thank you so much to them. And then as always, if you enjoyed this interview or any of our previous ones, please help us spread the word. We ask every week because it is important when you tell your friends or your social media followers, those are all the biggest ways you can help our show continue to grow. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I will see you next week. Bye.